welcome friends for this afternoon session of the first day of our two-day event in Stockholm, Sweden. I'm very happy to see you all again. I hope you had a nice break. And before lunch break, I had said after the break, I'll talk to you about seeking. Seek and you will find. Very straightforward statement. Absolutely true. Whatever you seek, you find. What you search, you may or may not find. Big difference, two words. Seek, search. What's the difference? Seeking is coming from the soul. Coming from the intuitive self. Searching is coming from the mind. Two different things. Everybody is a seeker, but they don't know what they are seeking. Something is happening, something is telling them. We are seeking something, we don't know what it is. Because they cannot understand they are seeking their own true identity, their own self their own true identity. Who are they? Where are they operating from? What's all going on? They can't define that. Therefore, they don't know what they are seeking. I have had a very few strange cases. There was a friend of mine in Wisconsin, and he was a great seeker. What was he seeking? He didn't know. When he met me, he was middle-aged. And he gave me a, a flower. He brought a rose. I appreciated the rose. I just happened to pat him on the head. He was younger than me. I said, that's all right. He said that day changed his life. He found what he was seeking. He said he felt loved for the first time. A simple exchange of roles. That was boldly symbolic. What he was seeking was inside him. He became so much in love with me and I fell in love with him. He moved to Wisconsin from New York and settled down there. He recently passed away. That's why I can tell you his story. He told me he has a brother who owns a yacht who owns a moving house, and it's a big house, and he's coming to visit me. You should come and see how he has a house on wheels, with two bedrooms, bathroom, kitchen, everything, and he travels all over, doesn't need to go to any hotel. I said, I would love to see that kind of moving home. He said, but watch out, don't talk to him about anything spiritual. He's a downright businessman and is only interested in money, only how to make money, and is good at that. But if you talk to him about this spiritual stuff, he'll be put off and won't talk to you anymore. I said, I'll be very careful. That moving van came and I went and saw, I appreciated it, how many facilities that little moving van had. And at the end of the tour, his brother was showing me, the brother said, I understand you give some talks. I got a little frightened. I said, it's coming to what I was trying to avoid. <laughs> oh, yes, I give talks, you know, general subjects, I give talks. Can I come and attend it? I looked at his brother who was alarmed. <laughs> and I couldn't say no. You're welcome. And he came and attended just one talk for one hour and asked for a personal interview, he and his wife both. In the evening, I met them for a few minutes. He said, what you said today, we have been seeking all our life. He said, we never knew this is what we were seeking, what you spoke of. His brother had no idea at all. 
The seeking came to the surface because it was not something mental which he could understand. When you search for something, you know what you are searching for. Most of the time, we don't search in, in the wild. We are searching for something. We say we want to find out the truth about this. We want to find out this. Mental search is very different. Seeking comes from the soul and we are not even sure what we are seeking. But when something hits the soul, we know this is what we were seeking. And the most important thing that hits the soul is unconditional pure love. Nothing hits the soul more than that. When that experience comes, we know what we were seeking, to be loved, to love. No human being is there who does not want to be loved and to love. But we don't get it. We mistakenly call our attachments as love. Attachment is very different from love. When you are attached to somebody, you make statements like, I love you dear, I love you so much, I love you. We keep on repeating that again and again, as if by repetition you love more. If you notice a person who says, I love you, emphasis is on I, not on you. Very often it's an ego stuff. I stand prominent when we talk like that and we try to show I am doing something for you. I am trying to favor you by doing something. And supposing you answer, but I hate you. The person who loves you says, I also hate you then. Love is finished. <laughs> These attachments maintain the duality of the one who claims to love and the beloved. It's a duality, it does not go away. If you are truly in love, fall truly in love with somebody, you think of the beloved so much, the I is forgotten. That's a sign of a true love. I, I have tried to study in my life, what are the things that can cause our ego, our I-ness, to be put on the back bench. The only thing I found was an experience of true love that makes you forget the I and think of the beloved. True love is very different. In true love, you forget yourself. You are thinking of the beloved, how to do something. Your mind is not saying, I love you. Mind is saying, you, you, you. It substitutes. Therefore, what we are seeking without all, always knowing, is really something that is beyond the mind. It comes from the spirit. It's a spiritual experience. All love is spiritual experience, no matter where and how. And that is why, when we come across a perfect living master, like my master, who passed away in his physical body, but very much with me every day now, that's another part of a perfect living master because he reveals he is not outside. He is outside to start with. You go inside, he's there. You meditate and go to any level, he's there. It's a very big relationship that is established with a perfect living master. When his love pulls you, it is totally unconditional. There is no judgment involved. He will never say you are a good person or a bad person. He will never say, be good, then I will help you, otherwise not. Never. Never make a judgment. And he is always forgiving. His love is that quality. When you experience his love, and you are not understanding that love, and you say, I hate you, he will still love you. If you hurt him, he will still love you. If you kill him, he will still love you. That's the kind of love that comes from a perfect living master. It's a rare event to find a perfect living master. Very few exist on our planet, but they do exist. How can we find them? Can we really lay down some criteria by which we know who is a perfect living master? Not at all. They are ordinary human beings, just like us. They are born like us. They die like us. They fall sick like us. They go to doctors like us. They eat food like us. 
there is no difference in their life. They have destinies like us. So therefore, how can we find them? If somebody was extraordinary, had some miraculous power, we could see that person and say, well, he is a miraculous power. He performed miracles. We saw him doing it. Supposing, let me give you an example. Supposing a unique person with miraculous powers suddenly flies in through the window in this, while we are talking. I'll stop talking naturally and look at him. So will you. You all start looking. How can he come? Is he levitating? Many of us will think there must be a rope or something secretly attached. Many will try to rationalize and find out how we can do it. Some may even be weak-willed, might even swoon and faint to see what's happening. So it's so unusual. Some may start worshipping him. Some may adore this feat. But nobody will love him. Love doesn't come like that. If he happened to fall down while he's performing that levitation, fall down, so many of us will get up and say, are you hurt? First time some love and compassion will come up. Don't forget, love and friendship that we're talking of is between human beings, equal human beings, not supernatural human beings. They can be worshipped, they can be adored, but not loved. That is why perfect living masters come as ordinary human beings who can become our friends. Friends first, masters afterward. That's their role. So we can't find them. But fortunately, because of their awareness, they can find us. How do they find us? They find us if we are seekers of what they are going to give. If you are seekers of love, unconditional pure love, if you are seekers of the highest level of awareness, if you are the seeker of our true home, they will find us. How do they find us? Coincidence, circumstances, unusual way of getting together, which surprises us. I, I used to find people from all over the world who would meet the great master, and each one had a different story how they came up to see him. All strange stories of coincidences. Oh, somebody gave me a book, somebody did this. All interesting stories, all coincidences, how they came upon him. And I also told you some came to criticize him and got the best deal that could ever be obtained. These are all created by our seeking insight. Therefore, somebody says, I want to find a perfect living master, what should I do? My answer is always very simple. Seek insight. Nothing else is needed. He will appear. Seek for the ultimate. Of course, if you are searching for answers to some questions, many people can come and give you answers. Some you will like, some you won't like. These questions and answers which intellectuals like to ask, and sometimes non-intellectuals also have some questions. Don't forget, questions arise from the answers you already have in your head. You can't formulate a question unless the answer is hidden inside your head. It's very interesting. Supposing you ask a question and we get a foolish reply. You say, no, that's not it. That means you know better what the answer should be. Supposing you give the correct answer, the person says, yes, I know. It is just a verbalization, just a vocalization of the answer already inside you. I have seen this over and over again. We accept answers which convince us this is the right answer because we knew it in our head earlier. That is why we ask questions. But when you ask questions, they can be questions and answers. It can be searching for something. They can be mental questions. When love affects you, somehow questions disappear. It's very strange that the questions become so irrelevant that we found what we are looking for. What are the questions left for? This has happened in so many cases 
that I found with people who are following perfect living masters. Questions are also a stage, very important stage. The importance of questions is that what is preventing our spiritual self, our soul, to know what it is seeking, it has to go through a process we call life. It has to go through regular life, which has its own obligations, responsibilities, duties to perform. Taking care of families, taking care of jobs, taking care of people. There are so many responsibilities cast upon us by our own destinies. We are trying to do all that with our minds. We struggle to do that. We try to find out solutions to them. So many of our questions are related to what we are doing regularly with our mind. Many people, 99% people, when they come to masters, they are asking questions about their daily life. I have a problem in my business. I have a problem with my health. I have a problem. My child has a problem. My parents are sick. Will you please pray, help? Master say, all right, we bless you. Blessings. They give, okay, some miracle will happen. That's the kind of questions. Very few people say, my question is, who am I? Where is my true home? Very few people ask this. Those questions, when they come, we get silent about other questions. Search goes into seeking at that point. It's a very interesting thing how some people have been searching all their life and seeking at the end of their life. <coughs> One such person who became very friendly with me, I was very young, he was old, was a doctor, a surgeon and physician from the United States, from Kentucky, named Dr. Julian Johnson. He had written some books, interesting books like Path of the Masters and so on. When he first came, he was appointed as a missionary by his church to bring, to spread the word of Jesus Christ, to spread Christianity in West Bengal, in the area around the city of Calcutta. He arrived there, but he heard from two Americans, Mr. and Mrs. Brock, who were initiates of this master. They told him, if you go to India, don't forget to meet this man, Baba Savan Singh. So he had an idea, I will one day meet him. But he was busy with his work. And he wrote to the great master, I heard about you and I want to come and see you. Great master wrote back, you are most welcome. You come by a fast train. Planes were not flying in those days too much. You come by a fast train from Calcutta. It goes, it does not stop where I live. In the station of Bias, where the river Bias flows, where I live, train doesn't stop. Train stops at Jalandhar, 25 miles earlier, or 25 miles later in a place called Amritsar. You better come and stop at Jalandhar. Next to the railway station there, a friend of mine, an attorney, Bhagat Singh lives. He will come and pick you up and bring you to my place and I'll be very happy to see you. Receiving this letter, Julian Johnson prepared his journey. After two days of travel on the train, he arrived in Jalandhar. The attorney was outside to take him to the great master. Before Julian Johnson came in, while he was still on the train, great master told Bhagat Singh, the attorney, the lawyer, let's play a little trick. Do you know master play tricks also? Let's play a little game. He never seen Julian Johnson. Let's give him a surprise. He will come tired after the journey, but he will still like to come straight to see me. I will come in advance and hide in your house. I'll hide inside your living room. When this doctor comes, American doctor comes, you tell him, doctor, you are tired. Let's go home, have a cup of tea before we drive to see the great master. 
and he will say, no, 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 I have not come for a cup of tea, I would like to go and see the master straight away. You say, no, no, it's not necessary, we can go. He'll get very irritated. This is what great master telling the attorney. He'll get very irritated and mad at you for insisting. But you insist on it and bring him to, his, to your house. And there you say, Dr. Johnson, I have a surprise for you. And you bring him in and I'll be sitting to greet him in your house. And it happened exactly like that. Dr. Julian Johnson came, was received there. <coughs> he was persuaded to come and have tea. He didn't like to go. He almost forced to come to his house and settled down in the living room. And then this attorney said, Dr. Johnson, I have a surprise for you, and took him into the room. And Julian Johnson saw him. Something happened. Some very strange feeling happened to him. He wanted to sit on the floor, which he didn't, never did before. He felt like he should sit at the feet of this master. Just the first impact, especially because of surprise. He had a nice beard, looked very regal. The master looked really like a perfect master. He had that countenance, the style. Great master said, please sit on a chair, sit on a chair. He said, Master, you came all the way to see me? Great Master said, I came only 25 miles. You came 10,000 miles to see me. Julia Johnson could not speak, just sat looking at him. At night, he had a small portable typewriter. I typed out a letter to his friends in America. He said, I have met this great master only for a couple of hours. I wanted to sit at his feet. He made me sit in his chair. But what I have got in these two hours, if I get nothing more, I'm satisfied. He has quenched my thirst and he has given me what I was seeking. Nobody could understand what happened. He stayed. He spent his rest of the life with great master. I was young, but we became friends because I could speak English. I was going to English teaching school, so we would communicate, and he would go walk to the river where a number of uh, meditators had built little caves to meditate in. Johnson also built a cave for himself, little better than others. He put a wooden door also outside. Nice, quiet place to meditate. And he meditated long hours. I also sometimes meditated in his cave, Johnson's cave. When we were walking up and forth, he said, it's the first time I met Tula. But he said, why did I meet so late? I am old. I am almost going to die. Why couldn't I meet this master earlier? I said, you should ask the master this very question. So he asked the master in an evening meeting, Master, I wish I could meet you earlier. Why did I have to wait so long, do other work? Great master laughed and said, do you know, it is not important when we meet. Right from your birth, you are prepared to meet me. Your missionary work, your work to help people realize the truth, your missionary work to help people reach the Savior was all part of the plan, all part of your seeking that brought you to me. Nothing was wasted. Don't think you met me late, you met me in time. That's why sometimes we can't even know what affects a person, all his background was seeking, but he discovered the seeking when he met a perfect master and his love. He used to tell me very awful stories of his own journey through life, how he had gone through several kinds of seeking, which he didn't realize what he was seeking, and came up at the right time. He had huge, wonderful experiences. He meditated a lot. He saw his past lives right up to the caveman state. He discovered a lot of incidents which were not good. 
and he was advising people should not look in their past lives. This life will become horrible if you remember everything that happened in the past, and things like that. Wonderful person. And when he died, great master told him seven days in advance how he will die. And he was very happy to announce how he will die. Anyway, that's another big story. Nothing is wasted in our life when we are a seeker of the ultimate truth. All we have done in different forms is taking us to that goal. I'll tell you one more story, true story, of an engineer. His name was Tadrokchan. And he was working as a roads, buildings and roads engineer in Burma, which is now called Myanmar, that country, neighboring India. And he was trying to search what is reality by reading scriptures, reading books, reading things about spiritual paths, but he was not satisfied. He said, I want some real experiences inside, not all this talk. I've heard too many lectures, too many talks. I want to see if somebody can give me something real. Then he heard that there was a Swami, a holy man, in India, in the city of Madras, which is now called Chennai. In the city of Madras, holy man, and he can give you true knowledge of your own self. He said, that's what I'm looking for. So he was a man, the Lokchan was very stingy about spending money. Like supposing we have say Swedish kronas, let's say this is a krona or euro or a rupee in his hand. And he would always say, to spend or not to spend? Not to spend, put it back in the pocket. <laughs> that was his nature. Because of this nature, he had even in a small government job, he had accumulated 30,000 rupees. And he cashed out everything and went to Madras to get true knowledge. When he reached there, the Swami, an elderly man, he said, have you heard the story of King Janak? He said, I have heard the story. Have you any of you heard the story of King Janak? Have anybody not heard the story of King Janak? Then I'll briefly tell you the story of King Janak to bring into context back. King Janak, king of India at one time, so the legend says, he was a great seeker and he decided to find out the truth, ultimate real knowledge, not learning, not books. So his ministers, advisors told him, king, you are born in a great country. India has so many teachers, so many yogis, swamis, masters, it's full of it. Just have a big feast. They call it yaga. That means a holy feast. Just have a feast, they will all come and you can find all the knowledge you want. So the king held a big feast and people from all over came around where he notified them and he put up big tents in his compound of the palace and then he went, he disguised himself became incognito like a tourist, that he was not the king. And he began to go and study what those people were talking in the tents. He was shocked at the arrogance and the ego of those people. They were arguing with each other. I know better than you. The same scripture they're holding in their hand and two people are interpreting so differently, coming to blows almost. He said, how could these people have true knowledge? They seem to be learned. They can repeat the books by heart. They have remembered the books and the words. They have no real knowledge. They are learned people, but not knowledgeable people. I don't want this kind of knowledge. He was very disappointed and came back into the palace and told his advisors, I am surprised. This is, they don't have knowledge. They have learning. They have read books. They have learned books by heart. I don't want that kind of learning. I want true knowledge. They said, your majesty, you didn't call all the people. A very short feast. <coughs> you should have a seven-day feast and by beat of drum announced throughout the country 
so more people will come. So a seven day feast was arranged and many more people came. Tents were laid out the same way. The king again went on incognito, disguised himself as an ordinary man and roamed around and found the same thing repeated seven times. All learned people, some wearing saffron colored robes, some wearing white colored robes, some wearing blue colored robes, some wearing no robes at all. All kinds of people assembled, looking very holy and all full of their e ego. I know better than you and challenging everybody. King said, what is this game? I wanted true knowledge, not this. <coughs> then the advisor said, minister said, King, the kind of knowledge you are looking for, there is a man, we call him a perfect living master. He doesn't come to these feasts. He sits on the bank of a river. And his name is Ashtabakar. Ashta means eight. Ashtabakar because he was hump. He had five, eight humps on his back. His body was deformed from birth. But his eyes were bright. And they said, he's a real master. He can give you true knowledge. The king said, why didn't you tell me before? Let me go to him and invite him. So the king went to Ashtabakar's little hut and said, Ashtabakar, I have come as a beggar, not as a king. I want to learn how to get true knowledge. Ashtabakar said, king, if you have come all the way to invite me, certainly I will come. So the king arranged in his own palace auditorium a big meeting, invited all the nobles, all his own family, neighboring kings, neighboring royalty, and all were assembled. And Ashtabakar arrived, accompanied by about seven or eight of his disciples. And as they entered the hall, they took off their shoes, which was a common practice at those days. They took off their shoes at the entrance and walked up. King had placed two chairs on the stage, one for himself, one for the master. And he received the master, Ashtabakar, asked him to sit there. As he was, as the master was coming, people said, this is what he's called, a hunchback guy. A hunchback, look at his body. And they call him a master, he's going to tell true knowledge. And just murmuring going on in the audience. So when the master sat down Ashtabakar on the stage, he said, King, what is the price of leather today? The king said, Master, what is the leather to do, price of leather to do? I thought you come to give me true knowledge. He said, no, I was looking at all the leather merchants here. No, master, master they are not leather merchants, they are royalty, nobility. He said, the way they looked at my skin, I thought maybe they deal in skin. So when people heard that joke of his, they said he has some sense of humor. So they kept quiet. He said, master, they are all nobility and they have come to listen to you to give knowledge. Ashtabakar said, what kind of knowledge do you want? He said, I want instant knowledge. By the way, I, when I hear this story, I sometimes feel that King Janak must have been an American in a past life. <laughs> they want instant everything. Instant coffee, instant knowledge. I want instant knowledge. Ashtabakar said, even instant has some time. Give me an idea of what your instant is. He said, my instant is when I go out horse riding, from the time I put my foot in the stirrup and jump on the saddle is an instant. Ashtabakar said, to that kind of knowledge, you have to pay a price. The king said, all my coffers are open. Name the price. I'll give you whatever you want if you can give me that knowledge. Ashtabakar said, I want three things. King said, you can take 10, 20, whatever you want. No, only three things. Give me your body, give me your wealth, and give me your mind. I'll give you instant knowledge. A strange price tag. The king thought, this is unusual what he's asking, but I am so keen to get it. He said, Master, my body is at your disposal. All my wealth is yours. My mind is also at your disposal. Give me knowledge. Ashtabakar said, are you sure you are given this to me? 
Yes, Master, I'm sure. He said, is the body mine now? I can place it wherever I like. Yes, Master. Okay, pick up your body, which is now mine, and go and place it on the shoes I left at the entrance of this hall. It was a strange request, but King got up. I've given the body to him. He can place it wherever he likes. And he began to walk in the shoes. Again, the whole crowd murmured, what kind of knowledge are we come to here to make the king sit on shoes has got to be knowledge? Some knowledge is coming. It's a very silly thing, what's happening? And the king, when he heard those people murmuring like that, he said, they don't know anything. They say there's a king with so many palaces and so much wealth, and why is he performing these strange things? When this thought came to him, Ashtabhaka shouted from the stage, King, you have no business to think of your wealth. You've given it to me. It's no longer yours. He said, oh, my God, I forgot. I have turned over my wealth to Ashtabhakar. When his, this thought came, Ashtabhakar shouted, King, you have no business to think about it because you gave it your mind to me. And the king held his head like this. I can't even think. At that very moment, enlightenment came. Just because there was some connection at that time by which when he couldn't think, something else opened up. Ashtabhakar said, you don't have to go sit on the shoes. Come back. Come back and I'll give you true knowledge which you just got. Any questions on what you got? Master, I got true knowledge today. I found out who I am. That's what I'm searching for. Real knowledge is finding our own self. I found I am not the body. I am not the mind, not senses. I discovered myself in one instant. He said, was it really an instant? He said, less than an instant I described. This is the old story of King Janak we used to hear. Now I come back to the Swami in Chennai. He so told this engineer, do you, have you heard the story of King Janak? He said, yes, Master, I've heard. He says, I do the work on the same basis. Give me your body, give me your mind, give me your wealth, I'll give you the true knowledge. Again, this man was like King Janak. He was so strong a seeker. The man who could spend not even one rupee agreed to give everything. Then the master said, the Swami said, let's start with wealth. How much do you have? He said, I wound up all my business, everything, and I've got 30,000 rupees. He said, first transfer that to my account. I have to build a temple. I can start with that. And he transferred the money. It is a big thing for him. He said, now give me your body. I will train you how to meditate with the body. This training will require breathing exercise. In the breathing, you will breathe from one nostril once, next breath, other nostril. Alternate. In, out, one nostril. In, out, second nostril. Then back and forth. And you will not use your hands or fingers. Because if you use your hands and fingers, you're putting your attention out. The idea is to put attention inside. You will manipulate this alternate breathing from within within the mouth, using your tongue for that purpose. You'll have to reverse your tongue backwards and operate from inside. And for that, you have to loosen your tongue, cut the tendons that are holding it down. He said, I also got it done. And the Swami pulled out his tongue like a snake, long, long tongue. He said, I got the tendons removed and I performed this exercise myself. And I will not do it by surgical simple operation. I do it by rubbing some nettle rash, which is a very terrible, painful thing. So it's a sacrifice of the body. This Trilokshan went through this torture for one <laughs> month. Absolute torture. But the tongue was separated. And he could then perform that exercise, breathing exercise. After he did that, the master said, now give me your mind. I'll teach you mantras to repeat while you're doing this. So he taught him some mantras and made him sit long hours on meditation. Sometimes he would see some lights. I am now seeing red light, I am seeing purple light, I am seeing this. And Swami said, you are making progress. 
After all the time, he said, this is not what I expected to see. I thought I'll get something real knowledge, not these funny experiences. These funny experiences one can even get by knocking somebody on the head. You can start seeing lights and that's not a great spiritual experience. So he got very disappointed. The Swami said, that's all I can give you. If you want more, you'd have to find somebody else. He was traveling, looking at other Swamis. Eventually, he was able to meet great master, Baba Saban Singh. He got initiated from him, did wonderful meditation, was very happy. Always he was talking of how much happiness this man had generated in his life. One day, they were all sitting together in a small group around great master. I was also there. And the Lokshan says, Pastor, had I known this real knowledge is going to come from you, I would not have given that 30,000 rupees to that Swami. It was still on his mind. And great master smiled and said, the Lokshan, you don't know. When you came to me, I transferred those 30,000 rupees to my account. He said, you have no idea. All the effort you put in there, I transferred to my account. And then he explained to us who were sitting around, he says, some people think we have gone to a wrong master, a lesser master. You need that at that time. You have to go through a certain process. Our mind interrupts us, and these processes ultimately make it possible for the mind to accept, even for a, for a little while, that there is something more than I can understand. This takes time. So no master is a wrong master. The master is at the time you need. Therefore, when you ultimately reach a perfect living master and say you want the ultimate true home, you want to go beyond your mind. When that state comes, all that you have done so far counts for it. It's remarkable how people do mantras, do various kinds of yogas, and at the end they come to a perfect master, say, Master, I wasted my time doing so many things. Master says, you wasted not a single day. It was part of the process to bring you to this point. Seeking takes you through all phases of life. Seeking in insight brings you to a perfect living master. Seeking brings a perfect living master in your home. In India we say, when a chela is ready, a guru appears. Which means, when a disciple is ready, a master appears. They don't say when a, ma a disciple is ready, he can find a master. He appears. He appears by circumstances, coincidences, automatically, when you have reached that point of readiness. It's not something that we plan and do it. It's something that happens outside of the time frame, intuitively. It comes by means other than what we normally rationalize with our own minds. And it takes a little while. Mind fights. Mind argues. Mind creates doubt. And I must tell you, the mind is an excellent accessory. It's like a computer. Exactly like a computer. And what you feed into it, it processes and gives you results. It is a beautiful, wonderful machine. It works very well when used properly. It's not designed to tell you what to do. You are supposed to tell it what to do. It has a feature in it called <coughs> skepticism, doubt. Very good feature. If the mind had no doubt in it, you would be so vulnerable to accept whatever anybody says. You'd never have a steady belief system at all. You'd never have steady pursuit of anything. The doubt gives you a screening mechanism. So doubt is not a bad thing. It becomes bad when doubt leads to fear. And you will notice all fear comes from doubt. <coughs> the mind functions as a screener, screening device by creating a doubt. Doubt leads to fear. I remember a friend of mine invited me to his house. He says, I want a few friends to meet you. And he said, there are three nuns in a church. 
they'd like to see you also and hear you. Because I believe what you teach is very similar to teaching of Jesus Christ. That the Bible you say, say the same thing, go within, kingdom of God is within you. The word is the ultimate creative power, things like that. I said, certainly. <clears throat> so I went to his house. Three nuns were sitting at the back. Shortly after I started speaking, they took off their beads and began to say, save our souls, save our souls, save our souls. They thought the devil has come. Now you couldn't help that if they thought the devil has come, how much we are already programmed to do like that. Fear came upon them. Doubt, fear might go into a negative territory now. I am mentioning this incident because the mind functions like that. It creates doubt, and from doubt comes fear. Those are examples we have seen all the time. Doubts are a screening agency, but the only thing that I have seen which can override a doubt, override even a doubting mind, is unconditional love. Unconditional love overwhelms the mind even. Even the doubts have no place. The doubts seem to look irrelevant when that experience comes. And that is why the perfectly master don't say don't doubt. They say use your mind. And if somebody is using the mind too much, they say use it more. Till you are able to overcome. Great master used to say most of his disciples belong to two categories. One who think too much and some who don't think at all. Some who are always inter analyzing everything, always intellectualizing everything, and some who don't think much, they say, we just want the truth. Especially simple villagers, not educated, not been to college, they would come, we just want blessing, we want to know what the truth is. Not many questions, not many doubts. Others would come and question him. There used to be, I remember, three barristers, practitioners of law, and two professors from England came, and they were sitting with great master. I was doing a little work to bring some water or something for these people, and I heard their conversation. Those educated people said, Master, we want to understand why you say there's a limit on what the mind can do. We keep on hearing that the soul is different, mind can't do things. We are highly educated people. We spent our life educating ourselves. And we believe the mind can understand anything. And the mind can appreciate, understand even what you are talking, spiritual truth. What makes you think that there is a limitation upon the mind? Great Master said, in addition to your mind, do you also have a belief system? Do you belong to religion? Yes, I wish as we do. What do you believe? We believe in God. All of you? All of us believe in God. Yes, it's natural. There's a creative power and we believe in God. Great Master said, you believe in one God or more? One God. There is only one God. Where is God? What does your religion say? What does your belief system say? Where is God? <coughs> they said, God is within us. <coughs> he said, are you sure? We have always believed that. Kingdom of God is within Jesus Christ said so. We have to find God inside. We know that. Kingdom is inside. He said, is God in you, you, you are eight people. Have you divided God amongst yourself or is it in one? No, we never divide God. But you say God is inside. In whom? And all eight. Explain to me with your minds how God can still be one inside a body of a person and you are eight of them all claiming the God is inside us and he's not been broken or divided. Just explain with your mind. They had no answer. He said there are so many questions which the mind cannot comprehend or answer. I just gave you one example. 
he would discuss with his intellectuals in intellectual way like that and with others he would just say you are ready to go home so he had a style of dealing with people who had questions intellectual questions answer those intellectual questions put them back almost like a socratic socratic way you know how socrates taught socrates taught his students about the truths by questioning them and they would give an answer he put a second question third question and from the question they tried to answer got the right answer themselves great master to some extent followed that he put questions he let you discover the answer is with you and just by little questioning the answer comes out of you only i am mentioning these things because doubts are overcome and we find that doubts become irrelevant and we begin to understand the nature of doubt where it comes from it is almost like the mind which we were given to use in life it become our master and when we reverse this role and want to rule it it seems to be having its own identity which we have given our own identity to the mind and mind is re- resisting mind resists your attempt to go beyond it it's a very interesting fact that the mind becomes so resistant it will try to lead your attention out when you try to meditate within people tell me all the time mind is thinking all the time we have big problem we don't know how to meditate that's a, that is the function of the mind in trying to protect itself it feels it's going to die if you go beyond it and try to live it's a natural function of the mind and therefore when your inner knowledge your self confidence based upon true self and not based on the mind comes up and you can assert yourself over the mind the mind try to fight i have seen people who say we have studied our mind we have been able to stop thinking i have never seen anybody stop thinking but one friend of mine claimed he had learned how to stop thinking he was a student at harvard university i had gone to study economics and government something there but he and i used to discuss meditation and he used to say you cannot you cannot have a spiritual experience unless you can still your mind he quoted from some scripture indian scripture you have to still your mind i said what does still ne- stillness of mind mean it means don't think i said can you achieve it he said i have achieved it i was surprised one day he called me he said eureka i have found the way to stop thinking i said will you please come over to my apartment and we'll try out how to stop thinking i like to learn it myself and he came i said how do you stop thinking i have never known anybody not even myself i thought that thinking is so continuous a process it happens whether you are sleeping awake any time 24/7 thinking is like the heartbeat of the mind like the body's heartbeat keeps us survive in survival so does the mind survive by ha- thinking he said no i have found a particular yogic asana a position in which i place myself and then i have a particular way of uh, treating the mind and i hold it and stop thinking i said let us do it now how long can you do it i said i can easily do for half an hour i said if you can stop your thinking for 1 minute 60 seconds i believe you can do it for life let's try for 1 minute right now take your position the asana you want and all i will do is look at my watch and when the second hand reaches the top i'll give you a clap you stop thinking after 60 seconds i'll give a second clap you start thinking then we will find out what happens to human consciousness when the mind is not thinking i said it's a very big experiment for me to understand what happens when you totally blank and no thought is there at all what happens to consciousness what happens to life he said sure so he got into that position 
I gave a clap, waited 60 seconds, second clap. I said, did you stop thinking for the entire 60 seconds? He said, yes. I said, let me ask you a few simple questions. When I gave a clap, how did you know that's the time to stop thinking? Not, not try to make an answer, just recall. It just happened a few minutes ago. Just try to remember what actually happened. He said, I do remember when you clapped. I said, now is the time to stop thinking. I said, that looks like me to a thought. He said, just a few seconds. Said, All right, cut out three seconds. Experiment in all 57 seconds. After that, how did you know that when I give a second clap, you can restart thinking? Remember, don't think, remember what actually happened. And he remembered. And he said, now I remember. After I said, now is the time to stop thinking and I will not think again till he claps again. <laughs> Looks like another thought. I said, okay. Take away 10 seconds of your time, 50 seconds experiment. Now tell me how you prepared when you were blank, prepared to start thinking when I clap again. And as he began to recall what actually happened, he went on recalling that he was anticipating and thinking about the second clap all the time. <laughs> Otherwise he couldn't do it. He said, oh my God. I was thinking all the time. I said, how did you think they have stopped thinking? I don't know. I said, I know. I can tell you how you thought to stop thinking. Because you did not realize the mind does not think in one channel. Mind thinks in several channels. Especially people who do mantra repetition, they know. They make the mind repeat the mantra. On top of it, the mind is speaking in a slightly, slightly finer voice. Am I doing it too fast? Am I doing it right? That's also mind. That's also thought. But our attention is on the first level. That thinking, that commentator is somebody else. That's also your mind. If you control two levels, third one comes up. Many people I've met who have, have been able to discover by study that their mind can think in as many as five channels. I had the opportunity to meet Dalai Lama and take care of him when he came in ref as a refugee into India. I happened to be a civil servant put in charge of taking care of him. And we used to go together and discuss meditation. He was young when he came. He had two tutors with him, senior tutor and junior tutor. They would teach him meditation. He would meditate eight hours a day. So we used to compare notes. And we were comparing the function of the mind. And he said he had studied and gone deep into eight levels of thought. That the mind can think in as many eight levels. If it stops thinking in words or language, it starts thinking in images. And the images start coming, also part of thinking. Nobody stopped thinking. Mind never stopped thinking. What they meant by stillness of mind was to ignore the mind, let it be aside, and you stay on your track, which can be done in meditation. It's a technique. We can learn to do it. Why I'm pointing out this is that when mind has doubts, mind thinks in certain ways, we're trying to train the mind to do certain things. Mind can only be controlled if your spiritual will becomes strong, stronger than mental will. And an exercise can do that. That's what we do in our meditation workshops. What do we sit and do? We do how the spiritual will can become stronger than your mental will. Big change takes place in our whole life after that. Big change is you are using the mind, not being used by the mind. You are the master, not your mind. Right now the mind is our master. As if thinking is going to tell us everything what to do. No. Let inner awareness, let the awareness which is intuitive, like a gut feeling, like something coming from inside, first thought coming in the morning, let those be your decisions. And use your mind to fill them up, see how good you'll feel. Life changes with that, with this one simple 
exercise. That is because the mind was given to us to be used. It's a great device. It communicates. I am communicating with you because of the mind. I am using language because of the mind. It's very useful to use the mind. But don't make it your master. Be the master yourself. I gave these examples to you just to tell you that you are all seekers sitting here. I know that. You're all seekers. You wouldn't be sitting here if you have not seen. Seeking is inside you. Seeking has brought you to this position. Seeking is going to take you ahead. Seeking is going to lead you to find a perfect living master. There's no question about it. Searching will not. Don't spend too much time searching. Follow what your intuitive self says. Don't forget. Thinking is mental. Intuition is spiritual. Thinking occurs in time and space. Intuition outside of time and space. The smallest thought takes time. Intuition, intuitive knowing never takes time. A friend of mine said, I have learned how to develop intuition. I said, that's wonderful. Can you teach me also? Give me an example how you develop and how you use your intuition. He said, I'll tell you. I have to decide whether I should go north or south tomorrow morning. Now I'm going to use my intuition. I said, all right. He said, uh, north. I said, north is all right. What about uh, before that? It's just a thought. It's a function of the mind. <laughs> That's not called intuition at all. Intuition is something says I have to go north. You say, no, mind says I have to, my program is in the south. Something is saying going there. My mind is saying no. That's intuition. Intuition is not a training. You can't train yourself to have intuition. It's there already. We don't use it. All the time we have these intuitive flashes coming to us. We don't use them. We dismiss them. How? By thinking. Thinking destroys our own intuitive intelligence. And we use mental intelligence for everything. Just try experiments. Do the experiment with this. That if you try to make your decision intuitive and then carry out with your mind, how good your life changes. Even physical life. Not I'm talking of eternal life. Even physical outside life changes. Your decisions become so valid and becomes like they're consistent with the plan of living. Now it's confusion. The more we use the mind, the more we get into confusion. If supposing somebody comes to me and says, on a particular subject, I'm absolutely clear. I'll say, let's think about a little more. Let's think the pros and cons of what you're talking. After some time, you'll say, I'm a little confused now. I've tried many times. The mind can begin to take two options, two sides of things, and then get confused, which is right. Intuition never does that. Intuition is straightforward. Tell you what to do. Use what is straightforward and is coming from your higher self, your inner self, your longer self. When I say longer self, soul only is immortal, not mind. Mind has a life. Sense perception has a life. Physical body has a life. Out of all these, physical body has the least life. Maybe about 80, 100 years, 150 years. Nobody will go to live above 125, 135. They found out there is a problem. And the experts have said, oh, those thoughts that we can have, transplants of all organs and live for a million years, is all gone wrong. There is, in our DNA, built-in structure that prevents us from not aging. You can't remain youth all the time, no matter what. You can try to look young, but you can't be young. And there's a time when you won't cross that because of the nature of the DNA molecule that controls aging process. And so the limit is now set 135 years. OK. Maybe a few years more one may get, but not 200 years. It's a very small time in terms of cosmic time, where we are saying, oh, this universe came with a big bang 13 and a half billion years ago. What is 100, 100 years, 120 years? Nothing. Inside the sensory system, which is exactly like us, except there's no matter in it. All sense perceptions are intact. Lives from 1,000 to 3,000 
physical years. That means we can take many physical forms during that period of one, one sensory system, one mind, one soul. The mind itself has a physical time of three, one to three million years of physical time. It lasts a very long time. And it is born and dies like the body does, but very long time. So we use the same mind for a long time. These have been worked out by people who have actually experienced at those levels. You can find out too how old you are. You'll find out there. We say that is a very old soul. Souls have no age. Souls are immortal. Our true consciousness, our life force is immortal. So never born will never die. Why is it immortal? There is no time there. It's automatically, if there is no time, everything is immortal. Time creates mortality. Time is created at the mind level, not above it. That is why soul is immortal. Our own real self is immortal. The true self which is making us alive and conscious is immortal. And these covers upon ourselves, they have limited time. Mind has a longer time. Sense perception is a shorter time. Physical body even shorter time. And all this can be examined by going within, just becoming unaware of the outer, finding more of the inner, gives you all this awareness and knowledge. So that is why in this period, when we say seeking, who seeks? Does your body seek? No. Body seeks food. Body seeks survival. Here. Body seeks very simple thing, air to breathe. Body seeks just some sustaining things, which are purely physical right here. What do sense perception seek? Taste, pleasure. That's what they seek. They sometimes get bad taste, sometimes they get good taste, but they seek taste. What does the mind think? Mind wants to find all things which, they can, which can be successful. I want to be successful in everything. But since most of the everything is outside, want to be successful in work, successful in business, successful in making money, successful in getting fame. Mind is thinking like that. What is the soul thinking? What's our real true self thinking? I want to get out of this mess. I want to go to my true place, true home. That is true seeking. Whether you call it in these words or not, the soul seeks to go back home with true love. Period. That is the nature of our soul. But we have hidden our soul so much with these covers, thick covers. Mind is a very tough cover because it doesn't let us go beyond. Can you imagine? There is nothing we can do beyond the mind and all effort to know which we make here is with the mind because no effort is needed for the soul. And we are such great believers in effort and struggle that we are confined to the mind. Sense perceptions have collapsed because they think that we are part of the body. We don't even use them independently. Supposing we can use our sense perception independently by simple exercise. Simple exercise of becoming unaware of the body by meditation. What will happen? Sense perceptions can fly, no matter, no gravity. Great opportunity, vast opportunity, see all the galaxies, go anywhere, examine this universe, examine other universes that exist above this universe. All possible for a human being. <coughs> but we are trapped in these three covers and don't, don't, don't use anything from inside. Here is an opening for us. Imagine, as human beings, we have an opening. How did we get this wonderful gift of being able to find everything? Life is in many forms here. Human beings are not the only living thing. Trees outside are living. Insects are living. Birds are living. Animals are living. They are all living power. Life is the same. Life is what we call the soul. All of them have the same life that we have. Yes. Trillions of bacteria sitting in our bellies, almost weighing three pounds. Some people say the bacteria has been discovered to be the largest organ in the human body, each one having a soul. Imagine the distribution of consciousness, how it has taken place here. 
soul all over. And yet, none of them. There's a list drawn of these life forms in Indian scriptures, which they list is 8.4 billion and 8.4 million types of life forms, species of life forms. Out of the 5.4 million are the plant and algae kingdom only. And the last 400 in that list contains a human being as one. Out of 8.4 forms of life, the only form in which we have an experience, unique experience called free will, is a human form. All others are programmed instinctively to function they are. We are also programmed. Most of our life is in instinctive. We don't decide when to beat our heart or not. All programmed, autonomous. Only we have some gaps when we make decisions. That's called free will. This experience of free will is necessary to be a seeker. Seeking is an experience of free will. So it's a unique thing that we have got. So seeking is a secret. And when the seeking comes, time will come. And if your seeking is intense, if you discover your seeking, and instead of putting attention on search, put your attention on seeking, I assure you, you will find a perfect living master. It's that simple. Seeking is the secret. You seek, you will find. Thank you very much for again spending time with me. And uh, there are some people who have asked for personal time. I'm very happy to see them now. And there are some questions also. I can spend a few minutes in answering few questions. <coughs> What is the technique to stay in wakeful state in other states like dream state and other states? The question really is that is there a technique, is there a way in which we can manage to do that? In the wakeful state, you're born in the wakeful state, in the physical body. Wakeful state is a normal physical state of being. It's a requirement of bi biological self to have rest from the wakeful state and go to sleep state. Sleep state is also several levels. Initial sleep state, we can get dream state in which we recall the day's events, the last problem we were thinking of that can get, go induce a dream state and then move on. Then we have some deep sleep when we feel we have no, no dreams at all. Then we get back into a dream state and those dreams are not related to what you were thinking in the daytime. Then we go back again. We have several dreams every night. Some people tell me we've never had a dream. Everybody had dreams. When I first came to this country in the 60s, in the United States when I came, I discovered there were sleep institutes. Sleeps and dreams were a big discussion, big subject of discussion. So I joined one of the sleep clinics to understand what sleep is, what dream is. There, the technicians would put all the equipment on your eyes, cameras on your eyes, other electrodes and all to just see your vital signs and the cameras will study your rapid eye movement because when you're dreaming the eyes move rapidly and this can be seen even on top of the eyes even with eyes closed it's the rapid eye movement of the inner eye and that's a sign that you are dreaming and when it stops you're in deep sleep everybody sleep and dreams several times that was found out even those who said we never dream there we find that a dream does not last more than 12 minutes ever. Normal dreams are very short, if not interrupted, they're about seven or eight minutes. Again, we go to deep sleep, another dream sequence, another sleep. So dreams are automatic in our sleep process. But unique state of dream is that when we go into dream state, we create a different time space, not the one we dream in. For example, 
one subject who were dreaming and when they had this rapid eye movement they would wake them up and record what the person speaks or one person says yes i was up on a mountain and i saw something very far off it bright like a <coughs> rainbow was coming in and it was moving towards me i had never seen a rainbow move okay it can happen in a dream it can't happen here where was a rainbow in which sky not this sky dream sky how long did it take oh i was there for about an hour watching dream was only 7 minutes one unique case i remember during that clinic was where a man dreamt that he was a child and he went to school he remembered his school and he met a girl whom he loved a lot teenage sweetheart then he went to college better again and decided to marry they married they had children and he grew old their grandchildren he was very old he said how wonderful to have a family and he woke up all in 7 minutes he lived his whole life in 7 minutes time and space are very different you can have a dream and see an old castle never seen before it made of new kind of bricks you have never seen before and you ask a guide can you tell me how old this castle is 3000 years old looks 3000 years old vast sky vast old castle you wake up before you dream there was no castle in 7 minutes you create a castle along with 3000 years along with it so in the dream state you create something very different but it's a natural phenomenon you don't have to try to get into dream state you get into it if somebody has a problem of sleeping then they take pills right and this sleeping pill don't give too many dream sequences they don't remember many dreams another way of dreaming and uh, of going to sleep quickly which i suggest to people is to meditate you know when people try to meditate sleep overcomes us a very common thing not only when i meditate many people sleep while i'm talking to them this is is this subject to such it makes us very sleepy only when it touches something that we, we are interested in we can keep awake otherwise we can try very hard to keep awake sometimes it's a natural tendency of the mind to shut down something that is going to attack the mind itself it's a defense mechanism therefore when we have sleep state it come naturally when we have the higher state of wakefulness that also come naturally when physically we die naturally when physical death takes place the body is no more av- available there so we go into that astral state or st- state of sensory perceptions have a disembodied spirit with all sense perception intact all mind intact soul intact same soul same mind same sense perception no physical body my body having sense perceptions so we get into that state anyway or you can attain the state by meditation by withdrawing attention and get that state you can get other states also by the process of withdrawing attention and becoming unaware becoming unaware does not mean you are leaving the body unawareness is merely for a moment for some time just to not be aware of body and be more aware of what's inside these things are not separate they are all working jointly we can't have eyes and see with these eyes if the inner eyes were not see we can't say that we have only a brain to think of this brain thinks because we have a mind that can think independently also but we associate everything with a physical level where we are awake when we are awake at other levels we have the same things operating except the physical body the mental level mind operating and not the sense perception the physical body these are basic levels to which we can go so far as experiences are concerned we can generate all kinds of experiences if everything is in us can we accidentally also have those experiences yes we can some people have an accidental experience of seeing a sky which is not sky like this at all i have seen people having suddenly felt they saw a sky which was made of gold orange shining but that's a natural sky in the causal state 
if you meditate you can go to the sky at the mind level the sky which is still in space and time turns orange colored in the astral stage it becomes twilight evening color no night here it's night and day you can have accidental experiences glimpses which are all within you the attention can go anywhere and create those things but deliberately the technique to have higher level of wakefulness is meditation good meditation which is simple process meditation people do in many ways people do yoga call it meditation yoga i see yoga books old yogi dro patanjali wrote yoga other people raj yoga so and so yoga hatha yoga all kinds of yoga books are written and emphasizing on the physical movement of your body and the very asanas or posture you can adopt how can a posture give you inner knowledge how can an outside body posture give you inner knowledge i have not seen anybody get it it's good for health where was it introduced read the history <coughs> history of yoga how it started these people who wanted to meditate inside did it in quiet places and made caves very small caves sat inside those caves in darkness to find what is inside to avoid the distraction of light sound from outside in those caves they sat for long periods the body needed exercise they designed exercises we did not need jogging or going outside you could put your position in different form and every muscle every part of the body could be exercised 84 positions have been recorded which you can do in a closed space and get all the exercise your body needs how can you call something that designed for exercising the body as giving an entitlement to inner knowledge it doesn't inner knowledge comes by meditation this is just to keep the body healthy so that is why when people meditate and they tell me what they are meditating many people meditate on music meditational music i said let me also meditate i was in hawaii i remember and a group was using meditational music they were also preparing they were musicians themselves composers so they would compose with the sound of the sea with bird chirping they would take up some natural sound like this very soft and nice i enjoyed them i played those discs myself i enjoyed them i can enjoy even today but that is not meditation i am talking of you are meditating upon something created external you are not meditating on the self so therefore when i talk of meditation which can give you these results i am talking of that requires meditation on the self with it and it is very easy made difficult by the mind easy all it requires is put your attention on the self as you feel now where the self is no discovery of anything close your eyes not to be obstructed uh, get a distraction from outside be in a quiet place put your attention where you believe you are think this body of yours is a house you live in because the body has several organs placed in an order which serve to provide some kind of a circuitry of energy around it and we call them six chakra centers and many people think that going to six chakras of energies is enlight- is enlightenment not at all that develops energy energetic experience is very different from experience of awareness think that this body is a house of your in which you live you are on the sixth floor because five chakras are below you every chakra creates a floor for you you are on the sixth floor sitting on the sixth floor decorate it put a nice carpet nice chair sit in the chair inside relax there and say what am i doing here what is this place talk to yourself call friends call for a tea party everything inside not connected with anything outside you are in meditation the meditation that will make you unaware of the outside and then of the body and open up your inner self these are techniques not difficult to learn 
difficult to practice because the mind will fight it. Mind tries to again take us back into attachment and desire outside. We have packed ourselves with attachments to things outside. And those attachments come as an exercise, defensive exercise by the mind. And they really create some problem in doing it quickly. But with patience, you can do it. Method is very simple. Go within your own self. Wherever you believe your conscious self is operating from. In any body, in any state. And you reach the truth. So these are the techniques that I can mention. We can only, the second part of the question is, can we withdraw attention in other wakeful states or only in human wakeful state? Only in human wakeful state. Simple reason, only human wakeful states have the free will to seek and do this. Others are all programmed to live as they are. No bird can do it, no tree can do it, no cat can do it, no horse can do it, no angel can do it. Why not angels? They already know the future. How can we know it? We don't know the future. Supposing we were able to know the future, what's going to happen tomorrow? Will we still have free will? Not at all. If we know that the decisions we're making is free will are already pre-programmed somewhere, and we don't know what they are pre-programming, we have free will. But we go exactly according to the script on which it is recorded. Because we can't see the rest of the script, it's called free will. Free will as an experience is not real. If it was real, there would be a big problem. And one of my friends, again in the university, he came up with this. He said, he called me one day. Probably the same friend who said, I can stop thinking. He said, I have studied hard. What is free will? And I found out we have no free will. And he said, I have found out because of my theosophy class, theological model that I have. In that classes, they teach us about God. And they define God very clearly. God is omnipresent everywhere. God is omnipotent has all power. And finally, God is omniscient. He knows everything. Okay, we take the third part. God knows everything. We are going to decide something with a free will. Does God know it or not? If God knows, it's not free. Then we are only doing what God already knows. It can't be free will. And if he doesn't know, he's not God, by definition. This was the very argument by which he came to the conclusion we have no free will. God has full will, full knowledge of everything, including what we'll decide, even with our own choice. Therefore, we have no free will. I again invited him, come to my apartment, please, let's discuss free will. And he came and I played a little trick on him. I took a tray and put a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, and an empty cup. When he came, I said, would you like to have tea or coffee or nothing? I've got all three here. He said, well, I'll see. I said, no, no, no. You have no free will. You can't decide like that because you say you have no free will. Just tell me without your free will. He said, how can I do that? I have to make a choice. I said, we have to make a choice with free will every moment of our life. You say you have no free will. I'm demonstrating to you. Even a small action requires free will. Free will is inevitable. If you say, I have free will or no free will, you're saying it with your free will. You're demonstrating your free will right there. How did you say you have no free will? I'm demonstrating. You destroyed all my knowledge of the morning with just a cup of tea and coffee. I said, no, I can take the other side now. I have proven to you that free will is inevitable. Now I'll tell you that you have no free will. And I'll prove it scientifically, not on belief systems. I'll prove you purely scientifically that you have no free will. He said, do so. I said, when you make a choice, tea or coffee, how do you make a choice? 
After all, something happens in your head. Mm, should I take this or that or take coffee? What makes you say I'll take coffee? What are the factors inside your head, in your brain, that decide to take coffee or tea? Let's examine them. Some can be genetic hereditary factors. Your father loved coffee. Your grandfather loved coffee. The genes are carrying the taste for coffee. And you have predilection towards coffee. You said, I'll take coffee. That's one set. Second set of factors is you've grown amongst people who liked coffee. You acquired the taste for coffee by living with them. Environmental factors. When I ask you now, do you want tea or coffee? Neither can you change your genetics, nor can you change the environment you have been through. Therefore, in truth, if you were aware what your background is, you would know that you had to choose coffee. The very factors that are making you give free will are predetermined by these two factors. There's no third factor that comes in. Scientifically, when we make choices, we are making choices based on this thing. There are only two kinds of pressures that make us decide what we want. You have no real free will. It's just the absence of knowledge of how the choice is being made. It's the absence of knowledge of our own self. It's the absence of knowledge of what will be happening tomorrow. Absence of knowledge what's going to happen five minutes later. That's making us experience free will, not have free will. Experience free will. But the experience of free will, no matter how real or unreal it is, is the most important thing on the spiritual path. Experience of free will gives you the experience of seeking. Seeking is part of that. And that is why this ignorance is truly bliss that we don't know the future. We feel we'll make the future. We'll decide what the future is. Very good. You also seek. Say, I'm seeking. Is something happening inside. That is why this whole experience is generated in the human form. This experience of free will only exists in human form. And that is why you have to be a human being, wakeful human being, not even sleeping human being, wakeful human being to experience seeking free will and going inside and finding the truth. Another part of the question. In death process, does pran and breath leave? What are the things that go? <coughs> the question is, when we die, <coughs> our breathing stops. In the old days, they used to believe that because we are breathing, we are alive. Nowadays, you can't say that because they can put machines to make you artificially breathe and make you live for as long as the machines are working. Breathing is not that. No. They used to believe if the heart stops, then you die. And now you have a machine that can keep the heart beating artificially. You can have an artificial heart in a machine that can keep working. Now the definition is death takes place when brain stops working. That is still the current definition of death. Then the brain stops, and it stops when the rest of the body is dead, and the top part of the brain dies, you are dead. So therefore, what we leave, not only breathing, not only heartbeat, we even take the thinking away and when death occurs. Nothing is left here. We take our life force, we take our thinking self, we take our inner sense perceptions with us when we die. So what happens? What are we taking out? We're taking out a disembodied form of ourselves. No physical body, but the rest is intact. So while experience of the world is concerned, it's intact. What do we do then? What does a disembodied spirit do? It depends on its attachments. It's attached to the children. Try to run to the children. I am here. I am not dead. Children can't see. They are crying. We miss you. We miss you very badly. I am here. No sound. Very frustrating experience for the dead person. You know, dead. We think he's dead. Where's the soul gone? Where's the person? Has he gone up? Has he gone somewhere? He's roaming around right in the house, looking at everything. 
and some person die they get so frustrated because the very people who say we love you we love you they dead they forget they say look at his pockets there's a check book there book how much wealth he left are we going to divide like this and the dead person is seeing all that what a frustrating experience and can't do anything about it the disembodied spirit is very affected by the attachment it has people come to me and they say we know you can have some contact with these dead people tell us i miss my mother who died what should i do i said pray mother go ahead on your journey go forward never say i miss you i miss you come back you are preventing even a further progression on a spiritual path for a person who is actually on a spiritual path by pulling it back so don't pull them back pray for their going for, forward and they'll be happy they'll enjoy your prayer so disembodied spirits stay how long do they stay and where do they go after that two possibilities they can go into higher state of the astral self that means a higher state which is different from this physical world or they can stay in the physical world which is an overlap of the higher state and the physical world some spend lot of time in the overlap because of attachments some spend much less time and they go to higher state the higher state have things like heavens and hells and whatever been described even when we worship god the power that control that is sometimes referred to as god and that can be found from inside he he creates and works on the uni- whole universe you can sit on his right side in space and time still they move there they come back based upon their actions and intentions in the life what is called a karma is it is a strange theory of karma karma is created what is karma karma is of three kinds one is we are born with it we call it destiny pralabd in india in indian language pralabd is what has already determined for some reason based on previous lives it has determined where will be born what accident will happen who we will meet where will be stationed what job we will do all part of a predetermined in between there are gaps left and it's only in those gaps that we use free will we don't decide where we'll be born we don't decide when accidents will happen we don't decide when suddenly we meet strangers those are not using free will those are all predicted in pralab and the destiny then when we have new decision to make that's called karma and karma or karma that is going to have an effect in the future our own mind has set up its own moral code mostly based upon the upbringing and where we are born how we are brought in what country what culture upbringing determines a moral code for us say this is good this is bad good evil positive negative and we use that moral code to judge our own intention and actions and our mind says that's a good thing you did you deserve a prize a reward you get rewarded this is very bad what i did i couldn't help it but i did it sorry punishment will come this whole law of karma which governs our destinies is based upon a moral code being applied by our own mind dividing actions into good and bad and most of them are where free will has been used where choice has been made not other actions supposing by chance i hit a man no intention of hitting but by accident i hit the man i had no intention it was not my act it happened it was pay off of an old karma that person hit me somewhere in the past if i hit him intentionally it's a new karma and therefore he'll hit me in the future somewhere he'll be i'll be punished the whole business of destiny on the law of karma is based on intention and action creating new karma 
a non intention non deliberation of the choices which choice to make past karma then we intend so many things in our life that we are continuously creating karma all that karma there is no way can be fitted into one next life so so much surplus is there some pieces are taken from here and a new life is made and the rest is stored stored where stored in our own mind stored in a place called a reservoir in india we call it sinchit karma sinchit means a reservoir of old karma when we have to form a new life sinchit karma is pulled out including karma from the past so sometimes you can have certain events happening which had no relevance to the immediate past life but they were relevant with a life three lives earlier they are coming from the sinchit that's how this law of karma it's a very unique law but it's governing our destinies and governing our life where is it operating from causal mind <coughs> you can go and see how it is generated and operates how destinies are manufactured i sometimes refer to them that they are like dvds a dvd a library of dvds is there in the causal plane we pick up a dvd let's play this and that become life here we are playing out a dvd and that played out and we go back play another one or we get trapped in the play of one dvd and take it so real that we begin to get attached to the player actors of who we are also body is also one actor we get so attached that it self generates the next life next life and we get trapped here it's a big trap karma is a very big trap because we can't see where it's manufactured how it is manufactured how we pick it up how our destinies are made and yet through meditation you can get all the answers by going exactly to see where you picked up the destiny and why did you pick up a particular destiny and why you are caught up in so many lifetimes that you could have gone back in one lifetime what kind of system is it now this life here is always created by events of the past otherwise you can't justify it there is a law that controls it in the bible you read a father brought his blind child born blind to the master jesus christ Master, why is my child blind from birth? Is it his sins or my sins? He had no time to commit sin. He was born blind. And why does the father be punished for the sins of his child who is born blind? And Jesus replied, if you see the Bible, he said, "It's neither his sins nor your sins; it is that the law may prevail." What law is he talking about? same law i am talking about now that is how a child is born blind past life that's the law big law this law of karma has been understood by these saints and mystics for a long time that's how the our events of life are generated so when we have these different kind of karmas we generate them generate our life if this is true one can say couldn't i made a better choice somebody who is always sick say how could i choose this somebody is poor couldn't i have chosen something better now there is a very interesting feature in this if you choose a dvd with all good stuff you won't be here you will be in heaven if you choose a dvd with all bad stuff all evil you won't be here you will be in hell both are in the astral plane sensory play it's only when you have a mixture of both that you come here and become human being and why is it important to be human because we know that's the escape from the whole system that here we can seek and find the escape from the whole system that is why we choose this in the first place with its ups and downs life is always a roller coaster they in mathematics they say sine curve goes up and down life is like that everything is like that ups and downs ups and downs and that is because we are chosen to be human and human beings have to be in ups and down to be in a state where you can make a choice 
then why did we not make a better choice? They are human beings living in greater wealth. Why are we born in Africa? Why are we born in a poor country? Why are we born in a place we are suffering all the time? Why couldn't we have the comforts of these people? Why can't we be rich and famous like the celebrities? Now, when those questions come, and they came to me also, I tried to see what is it that makes poor people poor, rich people rich and famous. Why this in inequality? I was surprised to find that poor people lack tangible wealth, but they have a happiness the rich people don't have. <coughs> rich people have all the wealth and emotional breakdowns poor people don't have. If you put the tangible with the intangible and study human beings, they're all equal. It's only some have something which you can't see. You can see wealth. I have met celebrities and seen their state of being. Terrible state. Multimillionaires cannot buy love with all the money they have. Cannot restore a broken relationship with all the money they have. They're disappointed with life. Nothing is helping them. Neither their house, nor their ten cars, nor their wealth. They're so terrible in terrible state. I met them. And I've seen God to a small village in India, people are farmers, and in the evening they're singing a song, face radiating with joy. Poor people, so much happiness, unbelievable. Anybody would give anything to get that kind of happiness, but you can't buy happiness like that. So when you say they lack this, they have something else, they lack, they have something here, they lack something else. Human life is constituted like that. We don't see it like that. The other thing is, we have happy moments and we have unhappy moments. We have pleasure and we have pain. Everybody. Pleasure and pain. But it looks sometimes there's a very unhappy place, it's more pain. It's not that we have more pain. It's not that we have more unhappiness. It's the nature of time in which we are living. The nature of time, the time which we just realize is imaginary time. Nature of time is when we are happy, time flows fast. When we are unhappy, time slows down. Real time at the astral plane works like that. Imaginary time. So what happens? We are suffering with pain. Time doesn't move. Oscar Wilde, in his book, in an essay on suffering, opening sentence is, suffering is one long moment. Very true. When the moment doesn't pass, you're suffering. When an hour passes like minutes, you're happy. So it's the nature of time. That is why even if both are equal, we say I've been a very unhappy person. At the end of the day, we are all unhappy because of that nature of the time. So that is why we say unhappiness strikes us. Is there any good in unhappiness? There is. Nobody seeks the truth inside if he's always happy. We seek the truth when we are unhappy in some area or the other. Very few people I've met who say we are very happy but we still want to find the truth inside. People want to use an escape from the unhappiness of this current existence. Therefore, something shocks us, something dismays us, something disappoints us, and we look for spiritual truth. If our seeking is for the ultimate, we find perfectly master. Otherwise, we'll meet psychiatrists, counselors, doctors, other people. They tell us how to handle things. But when the seeking is strong inside, we meet perfectly with master. When we die, the, the disembodied body stays. If we die in the sensory system, causal body still exists for a long time. The mind. Causal body is mind. It's not a body, really. We call it body because it's like a covering upon the soul. 
Okay, more questions tomorrow. I taken too much time on one question, three questions. Thank you very much for joining me today. I spent some time with people who have asked for personal time, especially those who are meeting me for the first time in this physical body. First time, I'd like to see them and uh, try to answer their questions. Thank you.